Thank you and welcome to this presentation looking at food, nutrition and musculoskeletal health, staying stronger for longer. These are my relative disclosures. What I'd like to cover today is looking how the ageing of the population will influence fracture risk and the number of fractures in years to come. Looking at bone over the lifespan because it's a very dynamic tissue, looking at it during growth, adulthood and into old age. Looking at calcium and bone and then looking specifically at dairy, its association with bone, with muscle and also with falls and fractures. And we'll conclude with practical considerations. So how we can actually improve dairy consumption across those various times in the lifespan. So this schematic demonstrates fracture risk. And as you can see, there are two time points in the lifespan when fracture risks are quite high. During adolescence, you can see, for example, the males in blue have quite significant um, fractures and when we look at both women and men, in women in particular after menopause and men slightly later, we see this exponential rise in fractures. So the fracture rates are much higher in old age compared to the other time, time points other than that pubescent period. So how does this relate to South Africa? The life expectancy is increasing. So if we look, for example, um, currently, it, it's around 65 years of age, yet by mid-century, that will be 71 years of age, and by the end of the century, that will be 79 years of age. So the older people are, the greater their fracture risk. This data on the right demonstrates the fractures in South Africa, and again, you can see that but after the age of around 50, 55 in women in the pink, and slightly later in men, perhaps more towards 60 in men, we can see this exponential rise in fractures. So relating back to life expectancy, the average life expectancy, if it increases into the 70s, which it's projected to do by 2050, then the absolute number of fractures is going to increase quite substantially in South Africa. So again, to understand this, we look at the distribution of people in relation to the fracture burden. So currently in South Africa, there's very few people in that sort of um, 75 plus age bracket in both men and women. But we can see that the numbers as a proportion of the entire population will increase substantially by 2050. So again, we'll see a sort of a, um, a bulging out of the normal age distribution pyramid with more people at the top of the pyramid relative to the bottom of the pyramid. And again, fractures, in particularly we're looking at hip fractures here, the absolute number of hip fractures will nearly triple by 2050. So we need to look at how we can actually improve um, and reduce fracture risk so that that burden can be met. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to be able to support that number of um, hip fracture patients, both in terms of the social setting as well as the medical setting. So as I mentioned, bone is a really dynamic tissue and I think we really need to appreciate how much it changes. So during growth, so um, before puberty, during childhood, we know that males and females grow at a relatively similar rate in terms of how much bone mass they accrue. But I did some work with twins, and in actual fact, the male twin of a pair had a wider bone than his female counterpart, so they were already at this advantage before puberty. Most of the changes occurred during puberty, and you can see that there's this massive increase in bone mass during that pubertal period and I'll explain more of that later. The increase which is called um, peak height velocity and peak bone renal content velocity, it occurs later in boys than girls about two years later but we see that the males have a much larger accrual during that pubertal period which means that they start life with a larger skeleton. <laughs> 
and again during adulthood we see that the males have a larger skeleton so part of their protection against um, osteoporosis or fr fragility fractures is the fact that they have a larger skeleton than women also though with women after menopause we see that there's this rapid loss of bone with the withdrawal of the estrogen. So that, um, to date, there's been no way that we can actually counteract that loss. And then in older age, you see that bone loss continues in both males and females. And again, there's a critical point where the mass is um, so low that fractures will ensue. So the older people live, the, long, um, the more likely they are to potentially reach that bone fragility point unless we look at what we can do to increase the bone mass during growth. To understand bone we need to understand the structure of bone and how that structure can influence fracture risk. So for example during childhood boys and girls have similar height and similar bone mass but the male has a wider bone so this is at an advantage in terms of the load when it's placed onto a bone. Again, during adolescence, we see that there's this massive expansion of the bone. So the bone widens even more than a female, and the female tends to uh, accrue more bone on the inside of the bone. Perhaps suggested is that this enables them to have children and to use the calcium from the inside of the bone to produce the fetus and also to feed the infant um, without compromising the strength of the bone. And again, as I mentioned, so we have a certain size bone, we have this rapid loss during menopause, and then we have continued loss from the inside of the bone into old age in both the sexes. So back to the point I raised earlier, if we can increase the amount of bone that's accrued by 10%, this will delay the onset of osteoporosis by 13 years and reduce fracture risk by 50%. So while we focus a lot on old age, we also need to consider how we can maximize peak bone mass during growth. So all phases of the lifespan are important in terms of musculoskeletal health. And just to emphasize this point, as I mentioned, peak height velocity, and may, many of you will perhaps remember your own or perhaps your children's peak height velocity when they just have this massive accrual of height. And one moment you look at your child and you're, you're looking down at them and the next moment you're looking up at them because they're so tall. So around that peak height velocity, we know that about a quarter of the bone at the femoral neck is accrued. And that equals about the amount of bone that they lose in later life. And again, peak height velocity occurs, and then about six months later, we get this what we call peak bone mineral content velocity. So the bone lengthens and then it consolidates. And again, in that two years around that time period, about a quarter of the um, calcium is laid into bone. So that pubertal period is critical and that's often a time when we observe that children change their eating habits and perhaps move away from the high calcium high protein foods in place of discretionary foods soft drinks etc so what happens when we have inadequate nutrition during growth so predominantly if a child um, is of normal height and they have a acute period of malnutrition which could occur they tend to become thinner but obviously they've got that height which they maintain however if it's a prolonged period of malnutrition particularly protein energy malnutrition the child is shorter so we actually can stunt the growth now, if that child moves through puberty with that stunted growth, it means that their height has been compromised. And again, if they're stunted and they also have ongoing periods of malnutrition, we also get that wasting. So the person is shorter as well as being thinner. So this period of time during growth is, is critical for both skeletal and muscular um, development. So what happens when children don't have enough dairy during their growth? So this is looking at the lifespan. So the schematic um, drawing is during um, childhood, 
adulthood and into old age. And it has been observed in a case control study where children were fed a macrobiotic diet. So it was devoid of a lot of protein and also contained no dairy. And these children, over half of them actually ended up with rickets. So we can see the importance of the dairy during that growth period. And again, during growth, again, another case controlled trial where they looked at children that had a milk-free diet compared to children that can, can, um, included milk into their normal eating. And these children, their fracture rates were 4.6 times higher than children that consumed um, some type of dairy in their normal eating. And finally, with veganism, so, the difference between a vegetarian and a vegan is quite different. So a vegetarian will include dairy um, in their diet compared to a vegan that has no animal-based products. And you can see by the, um, the graph that their actual risk of fractures is higher. So people that consume a vegan diet have a higher risk of fractures relative to those that consume a non-vegan diet. So you can see how across the lifespan we can really influence fracture risk by the inclusion or exclusion of dairy. Again, when we look at the timing of food restriction, this can actually have an impact of what part of the skeleton is affected. And this was some work done using anorexia nervosa as a model for um, energy restriction, which includes protein restriction. And these were adult women that had had onset of anorexia, either before puberty, which is the far uh, left graph, during puberty, or after puberty. Now remember when we talked about bone and how bone grows, it grows differently. So at some periods during childhood, it grows at the legs more than the, the spine. And then during puberty, we see more spine growth than leg growth. So if we go over to the far left, first we see that when there's deficits of energy and protein before puberty, both the femoral neck and the lumbar spine are affected because both are growing during that period. When we look during puberty, we have a much more pronounced growth at the lumbar spine and a slowing of growth at the femoral neck. So we can see that the lumbar spine deficits are much higher when um, a person goes in or suffers from anorexia during puberty relative to the legs, um, which are slowing down in their growth. And again, when we look at after puberty, we see that the legs have completed their growth. So there's no deficits at the femoral neck and there's a slight ongoing of um, growth at the lumbar spine. So we see that there's a small and just off significant um, reduction in lumbar spine width. So you can see that at the time of the energy restriction has a very big impact on whether the femoral neck the appendicular skeleton or the lumbar spine is affected. So we see now that calcium is important across the entire lifespan. It's not something we just think about when we're old or just think about when we're a child. We can see in actual fact puberty is probably a critical part. So what is interesting is that we know that this bone is dynamic. We know there are times when the needs for calcium are much greater than other times. Yet when we look at calcium intake, we can see that the calcium intake, and this is data from South Africa taken from a variety of, of studies, is quite low. So we can see that there's you know, a minor, but perhaps not significant enough um, increase during um, puberty. But when we look into old age, we see that the calcium intake remains relatively steady. So in actual fact, is this calcium enough in order to help preserve bone or minimize bone loss in later life? We also know that there are differences. So calcium intake is um, lower in rural compared to urban people. And also there were ethnic differences in terms of calcium intake. So we can start to see that there could be potential um, issues with sufficient calcium in particular groups. I suppose we also need to consider, and we talk about this later, socioeconomic status and things like that as well. So when we look at calcium 
intake and recommended calcium intake across the lifespan, you can see that it changes based on the dynamics of the bone. So during childhood, bone is, growth is relatively consistent. And so we see that there is um, a lower um, recommended calcium intake of 800 milligrams. That pubertal period, as I mentioned, where most of the bone is, a quarter of the bone is being accrued during that time, we can see that the recommendations increase to accommodate that accrual of um, bone mineral and bone calcium. Adulthood is a relatively consistent time. And again, you can see that, you know, during that adulthood period, it's a um, thousand milligrams a day, relatively consistent. We accommodate for the losses during menopause with postmenopausal women, the intake going up to 1200 milligrams a day. And then again, in old age, to hopefully minimize the amount of bone being lost, we see that it, it sits at around 1200 milligrams per day. But I'm gonna go now back to what we saw previously. And you can see that relative to what is recommended, there's a considerable difference, especially when we look in the older age, we can see that, for example, for women um, over age of 50, they're actually getting about a quarter of their calcium that is recommended. So you can see how if life expectancy increases and we have more of these people in these 75 plus age bracket, they've had insufficient calcium, this may be a factor that contributes to fracture risk in later life. So again, we've got their intake and I'm, I'm really pushing this point because what I'm trying to demonstrate is currently in South Africa, the requirement is, is um, an intake are quite um, different in, in the sense that there's a big deficit between what is suggested as calcium requirement and what's actually being consumed. We then also go back to the um, recommendation for dairy intake. So during that childhood period, it's suggested equivalent to about two to three servings of dairy per day. And if they were to consume that, they could likely achieve their 800 milligrams of calcium per day, because each serve contains around 300 milligrams of calcium. But then we have this um, broad based two servings per day for adults. Yet when we look at the recommendations, we can see that it goes up in later life, but the number of recommended dairy serves isn't going up with it. So if they were to consume their two servings per day, they may consume around 600 milligrams of calcium per day, but there's still the 1200 milligram deficit, which would need to be made up somewhere in the diet. So dairy's got a role to play um, across the lifespan and has been associated with um, positive bone mineral content accrual. This particular project, I've selected it because it was one of the few projects that actually accounted for puberty. If you recall, with puberty, you've got that really large um, increase in bone. And so often any changes relative to the dairy consumption can be missed. So this particular project, the girls had moderate intakes of calcium, around 750 milligrams per day. They just used one sex. If you recall, I said that boys and girls go through puberty at different times. The groups were matched for puberty, which is critical. They had few dropouts and relatively good compliance. And as you can see in the, um, the yellow colors is the milk group and the controls are blue. The milk group accrued more total body bone mineral density relative to the controls. So I'm gonna stay with um, growth at the moment. And the reason I'm gonna do is that we've got um, bone occurring and we're looking at nutrition with bone but we also need to consider mechanical loading or exercise and I'm just going to show you some data to show that the benefit of exercise in combination with um, good nutrition in our case it's the calcium and the protein that I'm focusing on so we can see from this diagram if we look at the muscle structure a lot of professional tennis players have pronounced muscle structure on their playing arm and quite small muscle structure on their non-playing arm. If I compare their two arms, I'm controlling for everything. I can control for the age of the person, their maturity, their genetics, their diet, because it's the same person. So this gives us a really good 
opportunity to understand mechanical loading or exercise and the effect it's having on bone. So again, this was work done with, with tennis players. And what they did is they followed the players um, through over a number of years and they could actually measure their cortical area, so the actual size of the bone. This was done with MRI. And what they were able to do is to compare the arm they used to play tennis with um, relative to the arm that they don't um, use in playing tennis. So as they're normally growing, their non-playing arm is used as a control. And that's what growth is normal growth is occurring. And then their playing arm, they could then look at the effect of mechanical loading. So again, you can see that there is a difference in the cortical area. So the total area of the bone, so it's a wider bone. Also the cortical area is larger. The muscle area is larger. And there was no difference in the inside of the bone. So in a sense, the bone was, was um, wider and so was the muscle with that bone. So if you consider this is the same person, but it's just their one arm that they use with mechanical loading relative to their other arm. So I asked the question, which arm do you think would be stronger? So I've got the non-playing arm and I have the playing arm. And if you go back to the thought of when we we're talking about males having a wider bone, so one arm is going to be stronger than the other. And if you guess the playing arm, you're correct. So the person is the same weight, but for them, that weight is over a larger surface area. So therefore, it's spread across a larger cross-sectional area and it's stronger. So therefore, we can see that exercise has the capacity to actually enlarge the bone, which is critical because the wider the bone and the thicker the bone, the more resistant it is to fractures and the less likely that person is, they're going to enter adulthood with a bigger bone, less likely they are to um, have bone fragility in later life. So they're tennis players, they're professional tennis players, but I did some work and it was like, what happens if we um, take normal children? Normal children. This is a school brace program that we ran. It ran over um, a school year, so 10 months, and the girls either exercised high impact three times a week or low impact three times a week. And what they actually did is they were provided with um, milk minerals that were put into a variety of foods, and I'll explain that one in a moment. So as you can see, each of the groups are represented by the different um, colored bars. So we have the exercise, which is on my left, and the no exercise groups are on my right, which are the red colors. So when we look at the tibia and fibula, so the lower leg, we saw a pronounced effect of exercise, which is the blue and the green, relative to the no exercise. What we did observe is an interaction between the exercise and the milk minerals at the femur. Now that's a critical part of the bone because, or the skeleton, because the femur femoral neck is where most of our hip fractures occur. Then when we look specifically at the milk minerals, we observe the effect, the benefits of the milk minerals at the non-weight bearing site. So when we look at the radius and the ulna, we can see that the milk mineral group, which is the red and the green, accrued significantly more bone at the radius and ulna relative to the um, placebo group. And as I mentioned, the foods were put into a variety, the milk minerals, sorry, were put into a variety of foods and they achieved around 1100 milligrams of calcium per day. So again, it's demonstrating that the benefits to bone can be achieved with normal children doing normal activities providing in this case that they're having sufficient calcium. And in this particular project, we used um, the calcium from milk. So during adulthood, so we see what we can achieve in um, during growth. Adulthood is a time where we maintain bone or we can have partial loss depending on the age of the people. And again, this um, graph demonstrates the the dairy group, which is in the yellow relative to the controls. And you can see that over the 36 month period, we could see that the um, 
the dairy group maintained their lumbar spine bone rule density relative to the controls where we saw partial loss of around 3%. Now the critical point here is that when we look at the calcium intake of these women as an indication of their compliance with the dairy, we can see that it's gone up to 1300 milligrams and maintained at that level in contrast to the controls that had around 800 milligrams per day. So the key point here is compliance is critical and ongoing consumption if the benefits are to be maintained. And this demonstrates this very point. This was an additional trial done and there were differences in the first period, so within the first six months. But then those differences, the two groups um, uh, digressed, or sorry, regressed together, and there was no longer a difference between the two groups. So the milk group had greater bone density at the lumbar spine at six months, and then both groups just maintained this, a similar level of lumbar spine bone rule density. So again, when we look at the calcium intake as an indication of compliance, we can see that at six months they were consuming 1300 milligrams, but then their compliance in the second year dropped off. And you can see by the second year, it's 45%. And without that additional calcium, the benefits were no longer um, detected. And we can see that there's no difference in the lumbar spine bone rule density between the two groups. So ongoing compliance is critical for a benefit to be achieved. And again, we look at older women. And again, this is a period of time where we're getting bone loss. And this was work done um, over a 30 month period and the women were um, educated to increase their dairy consumption. And in this case, it was mainly um, yogurt and milk. Um, just to inform you also is that the second half of this trial, they did add vitamin D to the, the dairy. But again, you can see that by 12 months, there was a significant difference in the total body bone mineral density between the dairy in yellow and the controls in blue. And this was maintained up until 30 months. Again, look at the calcium intake and we can see that for the dairy group, it went up to around 1100 milligrams per day and was maintained um, in contrast to the controls that had it between six and 700 milligrams per day. So the ongoing consumption is probably one of the most critical points in terms of ongoing benefit. So a lot of this work that I'm demonstrating is looking at bone, but we also need to consider muscle. And this was a shorter trial. It was only a 12 week trial, but Interestingly, using um, milk, so you can see that their intake went up to around 11, uh, 1400 milligrams compared to 700 in the controls. But interestingly, we can see the dairy group in the yellow had improvements in IGF-1. So this is now starting to indicate that there is there could be a potential effect on muscle as well. And the panel to my right, you can see that the PTH, the parathyroid hormone was um, suppressed went down with the dairy consumption. So from a bone point of view, we're starting to see potentially a slowing down of the bone turnover. So we can see that the role of the dairy in this particular trial can have both effects on the skeleton as well as the muscle. So protein, obviously there's a lot of work looking at protein and there's a lot of concerns now looking at, for example, sarcopenia or the age-related loss in muscle. And for a, an older adult, often they require more protein than for a younger adult because often they experience what is termed anabolic resistance. So more protein is needed in order to have that anabolic effect of muscle protein synthesis and ideally then leading on to improvements in muscle mass. And you can see during times of illness, needs are even higher still. So one of the things I'd like to highlight with this is that four of the trials were done in healthy adults. If we have an adult who is healthy and consuming sufficient protein, there's unlikely to be a benefit in consuming additional protein. And finally, the study in obese um, older adults, they were actually losing weight. So the consumption of the whey enabled them to maintain their appendicular lean mass more than acquire more lean mass. So we need to consider these points when looking at this data.
So the three things you need to consider is the compliance. Were they compliant with the food? And I know, for example, the first um, two studies, they had difficulties with compliance in the first study. If they're healthy, they don't have a deficiency, that we're unlikely to see a benefit. And also sometimes the lack of efficacy is because they had considerable dropouts. So they no longer have the power to detect any differences. So when we look at these studies, we need to look at them quite critically and discern whether it's actually telling us what we think it's telling us or are there issues with compliance? Were they deficient in the first place? And how many people dropped out? So again, when we look at um, whey protein and muscle mass in older adults, we see a similar thing. One is if you notice, there's quite a number of trials that included exercise. And six of the 16 trials, 10 of them were in healthy individuals. So if they're already healthy, it's unlikely that the additional whey protein or the dairy-based protein is going to provide any additional benefit. So really the focus needs to be on if they're deficient, how can we enhance their intake? And once they're healthy, how do we maintain an appropriate intake so that they can maintain that lean mass? And again, when we look at, at um, dairy protein and muscle strength, again, we see very few differences, except for the one trial which I've highlighted, where it was um, a significant um, difference in favor of dairy, but they also included vitamin D and there was an exercise component. So we really need to look at the data and decide whether, if I'm providing just additional um, protein, whether I can actually make a difference to their lean mass as well as their muscle strength. So the beauty of muscle, is it's plastic. So I can add muscle. Doesn't matter what age, I can improve muscle. Unlike bone, where under normal circumstances, I cannot add bone. Once I've reached my peak um, bone mass, that's it. I can only hang on to what I've got. But muscle is that beautiful um, ability to, to grow if need be. So interestingly, when we look at providing protein, um, in many cases, it's dairy protein, and we combine it with exercise. You can see, looking at the standard mean differences, they're mostly in favour of the protein and the exercise. And if you look, it's actually in most, um, in terms of body weight, in terms of lean mass, which is critical, in terms of function, etc., um, did not change fat mass. So what we can see that when we have and this is in older adults, when we have sufficient protein and we have the stimuli of exercise, we can make quite substantial improvements in both function as well as in body composition in terms of lean mass. So what we need to consider is combining exercise with that nutritional support is likely to improve function. Now, what we then want to know is the next step is, does it improve falls risk? Because if there's fewer falls, there's likely to be fewer fractures. So when we look at older adults that are at risk, so they're either frail or they're osteoporotic, we need to consider this holistic approach. So it may require nutritional support. It may require exercise. It may require vitamin D supplementation if they are vitamin D deficient. So we need to consider the whole um, aspect of the person, not just simply focusing on one aspect at the expense of another. So most fractures occur from falls, and I'll just explain the trial that I'm going to um, explain to you in a moment, that all but one of the fractures came from falls. So falls are a, a major issue, especially in older adults and those that are quite um, old. So for example, in South Africa, 22% of older adults, so those over the age of 65, fall each year. And it was the leading cause of hospitalization. One of the key hospitalizations is for a fracture. And in Australia, our data indicates that when we have um, older adults that are living in aged care, so living in either a hostel or a nursing home, their falls rates are five times higher 
than um, equivalent aged people in the community. Often people require care because of their high risk. So they're usually in many comorbidities, etc. So even those that are in the community, you can see as they get up into that older age, so 90 plus, we start to see that the two lines are starting to converge. So the risks are going up and you can see quite um, elegantly in the graph that after the age of 80, the risk even in the community continues to rise. And again, back to that point um, previously. So when we look at hip fractures, it is exponential after the age of around 75 and 50% of all of the fractures, all of the falls that go to hospital are because of a fracture. And if you look, so with aged care, just to give you an indication, 6% of the popular, older adults in Australia live in aged care, but 30% of the total hip fracture burden comes from there. So what I'm getting at is there's a small group of people that are at very high risk due to many factors, and they contribute a large amount to the total burden of hip fractures. And again, hip fractures are costly, and this is going to be the cost per fracture to the health system in South Africa. So again, back to the point earlier, we're looking at three times the number of hip fractures in South Africa by mid-century. It's going to be a large burden to the health system. So if I do have people with nutritional inadequacies, and in the case, calcium and protein intake, if I use food to correct these, can I prevent falls and fractures in this group just simply by using food? So we tested this in a large cluster randomized trial, which I'll explain to you. We used we involved 60 aged care homes. So the reason we've used aged care homes is that the food is provided and that they're in an, um, a, a semi-controlled environment in that their falls risk due to environmental hazards, etc., is relatively consistent. So of those 60 facilities, 30 were randomized. The whole facility was randomized to provide additional dairy on the menu. All we used was milk, yogurt, cheese and the other 30 facilities went about their usual care. We followed all of the residents for two years and we monitored all falls, all fractures and mortality. And then in a subgroup of residents, we did more extensive testing, bone mineral density assessments, we took serum, etc. So we could perhaps, if we saw something, we can understand the mechanisms. So with this study, what we did is we supported the food service team, so the chefs and cooks, how to incorporate more dairy on their menu. So for example, we might have added dairy, such as cheese and biscuits, to a snack or a meal. We fortified milk with skim milk powder to improve the calcium and protein content. We substituted, so in some cases, instead of using a gravy to lubricate food, we might have used a cheese sauce or a, or a white sauce, and we modified recipes to increase the dairy content. So these are the basic demographics of these older adults, and as you can see, they're quite old, they're in their 80s. Quite a number of medications and medical conditions, so they're often quite frail and um, have multiple comorbidities. Interestingly, and this was a critical factor, that their um, vitamin D levels were sufficient. You can see they're over 70 nanomole, which is critical because if they were deficient, perhaps we may not have seen the outcomes that we did with this trial. So I'm first showing you the, the food intake. So what we observed is that, for example, their dairy serves went from around 2 per day per person up to around three and a half servings per day and as you can see in the graph the yellow is our dairy group it increased straight away so within three months of the next measurement point and it was maintained for the 24 month period so back to that point about compliance if they're not compliant um, and it's not maintained benefits are unlikely the panel below that is the dietary calcium, and we achieved an intake of around 1100 milligrams per day. So this was conducted in Australia. So relative to that, that is our estimated average requirement. 
Dietary protein, which is the top right panel, went up to 72 grams per day, and they achieved a relative protein intake of around 1.1 gram, compared to about 0.9 for the control groups in blue. Most importantly, no change to total energy. One of the key things with older adults is they don't have the capacity to eat a lot more food. So very much about improving the nutritional quality of the foods they consume. So if they're eating nutrient poor food, they're unlikely to achieve all of the nutrients that they require. But by substituting some of these nutrient poor foods for dairy food, so additional nutrients, in particular protein and calcium, they were able to um, eat more nutrients in the same volume of food. This data demonstrates the reduction in fractures. And as you can see, this graph is the cumulative probability of an event. So every time a fracture occurs, the graph goes up. So the steeper the curve, the more fractures that are occurring. And as you can see from the graph, the blue, which is the control, has a steeper curve compared to the yellow which is our dairy group and we observed a 33 percent reduction in all fractures and the panel below is specifically hip fractures and we observed a 46 percent reduction in hip fractures and the differences were becoming apparent statistically at around five to six months and the data we had was supporting what was being observed that bone density was maintained in the dairy group, which I'll show you in a moment, and bone resorption was maintained but increased in the controls. So again, this is the bone density, and we used um, high-resolution PQCT, so we used that at the tibia and the radius, and you can see that the blue is our control group. We saw around a 2% loss of bone mineral density, at the tibia and radius in our controls, but we observed no diff change in our intervention dairy group. And these were statistically different between the two. So schematically, what, would, what this may then relate to is that when in the dairy group, they were able to maintain the thickness of the bone compared to our controls that the bone was becoming more thinner and more porous. And that's um, demonstrated schematically to indicate what that sort of 2% difference in bone loss is. We, remember, if that's occurring over every year, the bone is going to become more and more porous and thinner, and it will get to the point where it is no longer able to sustain normal activity. And if a fall occurs, a fracture is likely to ensue. So interestingly, when we looked at falls, we observed an 11% reduction in falls. Now, while that may seem a smaller number relative to fractures, if you look at the data, so the top panel are our falls, over 60% of residents reported a fall during that time period. And so, and we observed 23,000 falls over that two year period. So an 11% reduction is now equivalent to more than 2,000 fewer falls. And the panel below, we observed no change in mortality. So the, those that consumed from the um, high dairy menu, they lived the same amount of life, but with fewer falls and fractures. When we look at body composition, and we're starting to look now at, the, at lean mass, we observed that over the 12 month period, there was about a 2% change or loss in um, weight in the controls relative to the intervention group. Now this loss, if you move along, there was no difference in lean mass between the two groups. But if you move across to the lean mass of the arms and legs, that body weight loss was both loss of lean mass at the arms and legs, you can see the asterisk showing it's significant, and also loss of fat mass. So when we observe this loss of weight in these people, we need to consider it's not just fat mass that's coming off, it's also lean mass. So often in the case of an older adult that may commence old age slightly overweight, people tend to assume that if they're losing weight, it's okay. But in actual fact, that person is likely to be losing both lean mass and fat mass. Fat mass is one issue, but the loss of lean mass means potential loss of function and also the um, metabolic aspect of that muscle as well. It is reduced because there is less muscle there.
Now, relative to nutritional status, we use the mini nutrition assessment tool to, um, to measure nutritional status. And again, you can see when we looked at the mini nutrition assessment score, there was a one point reduction in the control group. This is across multiple residents. Um, in contrast to maintenance of their nutritional status with the dairy supplemented group. Now, what I've tried to demonstrate in the um, bar graph to the, to the right, <clears throat> pardon me, is that eat, when we use the mini nutrition assessment tool, people are categorized as normal nutrition at risk of malnutrition or malnourished. So our blues um, are representing the control groups and our oranges are representing the dairy supplemented group. BL is baseline, month 12 is their 12 month point. And as you can see, when we look at the proportion of residents that um, in the control group, we see that there are fewer residents that may, were in the normal nutritional group by 12 months and more residents shifted into the malnutrition group. So you can see that the group size was getting slightly larger and smaller for the normal nutrition. In contrast to the intervention, which is above, they pretty much maintained a similar level of nutritional status. So these differences, these shifts in um, categories was significant between the controls and the intervention. So we weren't able to improve their nutritional status, but we were able to help them maintain it. And what I'd also like to add is that we did multiple serum measures and IGF-1 improved in the dairy supplemented group and was maintained at the level in the control group. So we can see that we were able to potentially have an influence both on bone as well as muscle. There's discussion now on protein distribution as well as total amount. So some of the concepts is that if we aim for between 20 and 30 grams of protein per meal, this can actually help um, support muscle protein synthesis. So this data is from this particular cohort. And there are a couple of points. One is you can see that um, prior to supplementation, the intake for women was about 0.9 grams per kilogram body weight, and it was about 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight for men. And the distribution was below the recommended 20 to 30 grams in two of the three meals. So it's about how we can even out this um, distribution of protein to maximize muscle protein synthesis, and ideally then to at least enable these older adults to maintain their muscle. So some of the strategies that we used in order to um, improve the uh, protein distribution was things such as fortifying the milk with skim milk powder, and that can be used both as a drink, but also in cooking. So for example, if they do have porridge for breakfast, they're able to have it with fortified milk. We use dairy-based desserts because desserts are very um, common and, um, and often consumed. So therefore, if they're gonna not eat a main meal in place of a dessert, at least the dessert has nutritional quality to it. We use cheese and white sauces so that um, we didn't, instead of always gravy to lubricate, they could use cheese sauces and white sauces to achieve the same um, assistance with, with chewing and swallowing. We added things as simple as adding cheese to soups, providing milk-based drinks. So tea and coffee are often provided um, or offered first, but in actual fact, you can have milk coffees, etc., so that they're actually getting the same drink, a coffee, but it's milk-based rather than being water-based. And we provided cheese and yogurts for snacks. And by doing this, we we're able to achieve intakes of 1.3 grams per kilogram body weight for the women and 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight for men. So these types of strategies are achievable in these older adults and we were able to achieve protein adequacy because prior they were um, less than one gram per kilogram body weight. So some of the practical considerations that um, when we're looking at um, ensuring protein adequacy, one is that in Australia, and I'm not sure with South Africa, you may have the same um, issue, is that some of our yogurt containers are no longer 200 grams. So while you could be providing a yogurt container, assuming it's a whole serving, um, we've got containers as low as 
uh, 110 grams. So really look at ensuring that the amount that's being provided is equivalent to the one serving. Non-milk based consumption um, is can be quite difficult for people that have limited appetite. So in this particular case, to get the one glass of milk equivalent in calcium, it requires seven cups of broccoli. Now, given that we know that older adults can't consume that much food, that would be very difficult for them to achieve their um, calcium adequacy using that method. Um, use recipes um, and think of recipe ideas that you can incorporate things like evaporated milk and ricotta cheese. The uh, again, with, um, with nuts, which I did notice was consumed, um, you need to consider the amount. You can perhaps look at nut pastes as an alternative if nuts are too difficult for older adults to consume. The tofu, it's, the calcium content is based on the processing, so you actually really need to ensure that the processing is matching um, the calcium intake. Um, I often ask when, when asked about um, tinned um, fish that... They have to eat the bone because the calcium they're getting from those fish is from the bone. And I know that small fish are consumed quite regularly. So that's a, a really another really important source of um, calcium as well as protein. Some of the plant-based alternatives may not be fortified with calcium. So they need to be quite well checked because if they're not fortified with calcium and some plant-based alternatives are actually also very low in protein it's not an equivalent one-to-one -one. the glass of milk and the plant-based alternative may be providing quite different um, nutrition so again when we go back to our accrual and our recommendations perhaps we need to look at is the two servings sufficient? Based on the data, it's suggesting it may not be enough. So perhaps it needs to align more with the, the, um, the children's recommendation, which is up to three servings. Perhaps that's something that needs to be considered. And so that um, we can ensure that if they are achieving, for example, three servings, that's around 900 milligrams of calcium, that the other um, sources may come from their green leafy vegetables, etc. So we need to consider whether if they're consuming just two servings of dairy per day, can they achieve their calcium requirements? Now, one of the key things we need to consider cost. Now, if a food is costly, then it's less likely to be consumed in sufficient amounts. So this is data from South Africa, and I've just put the asterisks there because this data was gathered from homes that had young children, just so that it's not older adults, but just to represent what was um, occurring in terms of the total expenditure. So 30% of expenditure is on food. So that's a lot, so that's 70% left for other things, 30% on food. When we look at that expenditure within that 30% budget, we can see that the dairy um, is less than the sugar and sweets, beverages and other. So sometimes that substitution of some of those less nutritious foods for dairy um, can help ensure they meet their nutritional requirements um, as well as within the budget that they have. The three nutrients that were highlighted as being deficient was calcium, iron and vitamin A in this particular group. So again, this is based on the household expenditure per adult equivalent. And you can see that um, the majority of the protein is coming from fresh milk and sour milk, which is good. And majority of the um, calcium is coming from the dark green leafy vegetables and the fresh milk and the small tinned fish, as I mentioned earlier. So what we need to consider now is how best they can achieve those nutrients, but in a manner that can be um, economically viable. So we look across at the next um, bar graph and it shows you the cost per 450 um, kilocalories in this particular case, because this is a US equivalent. And you can see that the cost of the sour milk, the fresh milk, the small tinned fish and chicken are relatively similar. 
And if by consuming those, they'll be achieving both the protein and the calcium. And again, iron's an issue. The cost of meat, beef, is expensive. So I assume then from the total budget is they're having less beef, but ensuring ideally that they are getting the, the iron that they need. So the key point here is that the sour milk, the fresh milk, as well as the small tin fish and chicken, um, or I should say, I'll take the chicken out, those three, are sources of both the calcium as well as the protein. And again, with the chicken, it's a, um, a source of the protein. So as a food source, those three foods are quite um, uh, economical relative to some of the other foods, and also they provide both the protein and the calcium. And what I've tried to demonstrate here is, and probably this is almost targeting um, adolescents, because they're the ones that tend to change their eating habits um, once they've become more independent. But this is the cost of particular food items um, relative to the cost of, of dairy. And I've gone down to the serving sizes so that it's actually what, one, what we consider one serving size of um, the dairy. And I put the sardines in there as well because they are also an important source of both um, protein and calcium. So you can see that in actual fact, the, um, the sour milk and the milk are and the sardines are probably the cheapest source, yet are providing the protein and the calcium. And in contrast, when we go up in cost, when we see the processed foods, such as the donuts and the crisps and the soft drink, more expensive than these base foods, yet have no nutritional value. So from a cost point of view, from a unit cost point of view, that these foods are actually relatively economical in terms of the sour milk, the milk, the cheese, and to a degree, a little bit of the yogurt, but that's slightly more, and um, the sardines, relative to the discretionary foods, they are still cheaper sources of good calcium and protein relative to the discretionary foods. So from a cost point of view, is feasible and realistic and can ideally fit within a budget. So in summary, we can see that bone is added during growth and so therefore we need to ensure there's enough nutrition, in particular protein and calcium, so that they can maximise that peak bone mass because that's critical because that's what they enter adulthood um, with. So in the older adults, the um, adequate dairy consumption. So in this trial, it was three and a half servings per day, was associated with reduced fractures and falls. We may need to consider, especially in children, that dairy consumption combined with exercise is associated with improved bone mineral accrual, as well as um, muscle mass and function in older adults. So perhaps that combination can be um, considered. And as I mentioned earlier, it was a school-based program, so it wasn't necessarily um, athletes. And what we need to consider is how can we increase the dairy consumption and how can it be messaged appropriately um, so that they're consuming it throughout the lifespan. So during childhood, during adolescence in particular, which is critical in um, adulthood and also, and most importantly, into old age, as the population is aging. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll now open the floor to questions. Thank you.